Major breaking news out of Maryland. Maryland's so-called sensitive places rules or government-mandated gun-free zone rules have in part been enjoined by a federal district court judge there and Obama appointing, believe it or not. Stay tuned. We're going to break this down. He did not get this perfect, but it's certainly pretty good given the fact we have an Obama appointee handling a gun case involving the Second Amendment in the state of Maryland. Even a partial victory is a big victory in that situation. Stay tuned. We'll talk about it when we get back. Hey, folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of The Four Box of Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the U.S. Supreme Court bar, author of First They Came for the Gun Owners. Make sure you check it out. All right, breaking news. State of Maryland, after Bruin, as per usual with the anti-gun states, Maryland certainly is an anti-gun state, in a terrible place, specifically within the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit's jurisdiction, terrible anti-gun court. So several Second Amendment groups are in court challenging Maryland's statewide quote-unquote sensitive places law that was enacted as part of the hissy fit post-Bruin. And under that statewide sensitive places law, as you can imagine, they have masses amounts of things that are declared sensitive places, meaning you can't bring your gun there even if you are been vetted and have a uh, concealed carry permit. That includes everything from schools, museums, healthcare facilities, state parks, ma mass transit facilities, school grounds, government buildings, stadiums, casinos, racetracks, and so on and so on. The usual stuff. The good news is that a Obama judge, I mean an Obama appointed federal district court judge by the name of Judge George Russell III, has enjoined Maryland from enforcing part of that sensitive places law. Specifically, he has enjoined the no carry default rule, meaning that you have to get people's permission before you go on private property. That has been enjoined. He has also enjoined the ban on carrying guns at public de demonstrations. He has enjoined that part of the sensitive places law. And he's enjoined the ban on carrying places that merely sell alcohol. So that is a Good victory. It's not a fantastic victory, obviously, but again, in context, when you're in front of a Barack Obama appointed judge in Maryland in the Fourth Circuit, this is probably about as good as we're going to get. And it's a big victory for those gun rights groups that have brought this lawsuit. And that includes, and we want to congratulate them here, Maryland Shall Issue Inc., the Second Amendment Foundation, and the Firearms Policy Coalition, in addition to the plaintiffs. Catherine uh, Novato, uh, Novotnoy, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Novotnoy, Sue Burke, and Esther Rosberg. So congratulations to the Second Amendment plaintiffs for uh, getting a partial yet big win down there in Maryland dealing with uh, enjoining part of the sensitive places law. So now let's talk about what the judge did in his 40 some odd page opinion. To begin with, uh, he actually said some favorable things about the Supreme Court and the Second Amendment. Specifically, and this is kind of significant, remember how I've explained to you that a lot of the anti-gun judges and scholars are trying to say that Bruin is the new law of the land and somehow has replaced Heller in the context especially of gun ban cases? We see this in California with the Ninth Circuit. We see this in Washington State, Oregon. We see these judges trying to pretend that Heller's in common use test for lawful purposes by Americans um, does not is not the legal standard, and it allows these judges to reinvent and make up new stuff, allowing them to ban magazines and to ban firearms, AR-15s, and so on. But the good news here is, in fair, and I, this is a good job by uh, Judge Russell, I'll tell you where I think he went wrong in other places, but what he did get absolutely right is he said undeniably that Heller is still good law and is the law of the land. That's very helpful. Then he actually said he said the following. This is very good. He reminded, remember how I taught you here at the Four Boxes Diner, that when they talk about the Bruin methodology, it's actually not really the Bruin methodology. The Bruin methodology is really the Heller methodology of interpreting the Second Amendment. It's just been labeled the Bruin methodology because the Bruin methodology is the same as Heller, but Bruin did it in a paint-by-number sippy cup fashion. Like, hey, here, inferior court judges, you can't get it right here. We're going to give you a sippy cup of Second Amendment jurisprudence that you can't possibly screw up, which, of course, they still do in, in many respects. But the good news is Judge Russell understood exactly that, and this is what he wrote. Quote, consistent with its prior decision in D.C. versus Heller. Bing, 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 bing. Good news. Consistent with its prior decision in District of Columbia versus Heller, the Supreme Court held that when a Second Amendment's plain text covers an individual's conduct, the Constitution presumptively protects that conduct. Exactly right. 
Good job by Judge Russell. He then goes on to say, if the plaintiff's conduct is presumptively protected, presumptively protected, the government must then justify its regulation by demonstrating that it is consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearms regulation. The court held, the Supreme Court held, that the examination of a firearms law constitutionality would end with this historical analysis, thereby rejecting the two-step test that the courts had previously applied dealing with means and or tiers of scrutiny. Exactly right. So here you have a judge, Judge Russell, did a great job on, on explaining the standard that, again, Heller is the law, and Heller and Bruin are the same, and you start with the text, and once the text is implicated, which of course it is here dealing with carry bans in sensitive places, or so-called sensitive places, because you're restricting the abilities of a person, an American citizen, from their right to bear arms, which means the right to carry guns in public for self-defense. So the text of the Second Amendment is implicated, therefore the burden shifts, the burden shifts to the government to come forth with a historical analog or historical analogs to justify what they're doing. And Judge Russell got that exactly right. So he says, the text is implicated here. You're restricting these people's right to keep and bear arms because they can't carry guns in these places. So you, state of Maryland, got to come forth and explain to me historically, how is this justified? Okay, so that's all good. Good job, Judge Russell. Then obviously he points out that there is no historical analogs that justify preventing people from carrying guns without first and foremost getting a permission slip from everybody on whose private property they might carry. Because of course, among other things, there's no constitutional historic, there's no historical analog for that. And of course, it's completely unwieldy. It makes no sense. Number one. And of course, he points out that, yeah, you know, people brought guns to public demonstrations. Um, nothing, there's no basis for saying if it's a public demonstration or First Amendment expression, you can't bring a gun there. That makes a lot of sense, right? Because uh, as you know from the Boston Massacre, which occurred before the American Revolution, uh, the, the, the Bostonians that were confronting the British soldiers were armed. And, and John Adams, one of our greatest founding fathers in the Boston Massacre trial, when he represented the British officers in the trial, specifically said in open court that, of course, all Americans and all the Bostonians had a right to bear arms. But then he goes on to point out they couldn't use them offensively. They could only use them defensively. So the point is there's no, and of course, the Boston Massacre was initially a public demonstration that gave rise to a mass shooting by the British soldiers killing Americans. So bottom line is, indeed, there's no historical analog restricting guns at public demonstrations. And then he goes on to say, yeah, just because, again, at the time of the founding, people had guns at taverns all the time. Now, of course, whether or not you're allowed to be drunk with a gun is a separate question. But just by being like at a New York Greek diner, for example, that has a liquor license with alcohol behind the bar, you know, if you're you're having pancakes and eggs with your gun in a diner and you're not drinking. So what if they can serve alcohol? What does that have to do with anything? And of course, there's no historical analog at the time of the founding to ban such things. So Judge Russell got those perfectly right, 100% right. That's good. Now, let me tell you where he starts to go off the rail and get things wrong. The first thing he does was, as you know, typical anti-gun, again, at the end of the day, people that are biased against guns, they always are going to embrace, as I explained this before, they're going to say that the relevant time period for looking for historical analogs is 1868 which is when the 14th Amendment was adopted. This is exactly what the anti-gunners want to do because there's a lot more gun control laws at the time, many of which were racist, racially motivated against the freed slacks, uh, blacks. Uh, many of them were uh, just, you know, are against the Confederates, but there was a whole lot more gun control laws after the 14th Amendment for a whole host of social reasons um, as opposed to 1791, which is why 1791 is better for the Second Amendment movement. And of course, the late 19th century is better for the anti-gun movement. Now, the truth is, as we've gone over repeatedly, and I've explained in my detailed article in, in the scholarly uh, journal, the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, there's no debate, in my view, that 1791 has to be the correct answer. They did not have to get into that specific decision in Bruin because it was so clear that you had a right to carry throughout all of American history, so they didn't draw that distinction. But I think there's a good chance that Supreme Court and Rahimi is going to clear this up, and I have very little doubt that when they do, they're going to set the standard at 1791 is the right time to interpret the Second Amendment. And thus, that is the only period you're to look for historical gun control related laws is during that period because that is how they interpret the rest of the Bill of Rights, including the First Amendment, as we saw in Espinoza versus Montana, which we've talked about before, where the Supreme Court rejected 30 statewide laws restricting First Amendment rights that arose after the 14th Amendment, and the Supreme Court said that was way too late as a basis for historical analog, as a basis for historical analog to restrict the First Amendment's right to free speech and the religious clauses and so on. So I don't think there's any doubt that 1791 is the right answer and will ultimately be the right answer if the Supreme Court ultimately addresses that specific question. But nevertheless, here you have in Maryland 
Maryland, Judge Russell, embraces really the anti-gun argument that sure, you can look at late 19th century historical precedents and analogs to justify modern day gun control laws. Totally wrong, of course. But nevertheless, um, you know, he he took advantage of the opening that the Supreme Court unfortunately gave him with some uh, wiggle worm, uh, wiggle words and ambiguous words in the Bruin case. And he took advantage of it to justify a lot of bans. Specifically, he went on to say that uh, bans of guns, even if you have a concealed carry permit, are justified and allowed under the Second Amendment with respect to museums, healthcare facilities, state parks, state forests, the Chesapeake forest lands, mass transit facilities, school grounds, government buildings, stadiums, amusement parks, casinos, and racetracks. So uh, he denied the motion for to enjoin the enforcement of census places with respect to those particular places, and mostly because he embraced the wrong time period for interpreting the Second Amendment. Because remember, you start with the text, the burden shifts to the government, and then they got to come forth with historical analogs. And the big debate is, what time period do those historical analogs have to come from? We in the Second Amendment community undeniably want it to be 1791 because there's fewer gun control laws then from which historical analog gun control laws can be used to justify modern-day gun control laws. The anti-guns 1,000% want to use the post-Civil War period because there's a lot more gun control there that they can use as historical analogs to justify modern-day gun control laws. And that is why the 1791 debate versus the 1868 debate, why this fight over the years is so important because it's really going to expand or shrink the scope of the Second Amendment. And that's why I wrote the definitive article on this in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy to make it clear it's 1791. And uh, I think that's the Supreme Court will agree with me, but we will see in in due course. I should also mention there's one other critical, and it's, it is a mistake, undeniably a mistake, but again, you know, the Supreme Court with some language in Heller opened up this door for this kind of argument, although I think it was closed in Bruin, but the judge disagreed. Specifically, Judge Russell here concluded that Bruin held that schools and government buildings, in addition, in addition to legislative assemblies, polling places, and courthouses are sensitive places. Now, let me be clear. In 2008, in Heller, there was a general language saying that, you know, we generally assume that uh, certain th gun laws are presumably constitutional. And when we wrote the Heller case, that's all known as dicta. They didn't have to decide it. They just kind of were saying, yeah, we think this is probably the case, but we haven't done the analysis and we're not reaching a final conclusion. So they make reference to, you know, nothing about Heller is dealing with sensitive places such as uh, government buildings or schools. So what happened is Bruin did a much more detailed analysis of quote unquote sensitive places, as you know, because New York was trying to say they get to declare sensitive places and uh, the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do it and, and analyze this. And in the context, after they analyzed it with more specificity, they came out and said there are three sensitive places uh, based on the founding era history that they could see. Legislative assemblies, places like the U.S. Capitol or state uh, state building, uh, specifically a state house where you know the legislature meets, not all government buildings, just where the legislature meets. Those are That's what a legislative assembly assembly building is, uh, polling places, which of course is like for one day a year in a discrete period of time in a discrete place, and of course, uh, courthouses, which are protected by armed bailiffs. Um, that goes all way, way, way back all the way to the founding. And of course, we know general assemblies were uh, protected by sergeants of arms with guns. So again, it all turns on comprehensive security. Is this being treated as a sense of place so that you know other people are stepping up to protect you with their guns so you don't have to do that? So anyway, that. Uh, but what Judge Russell did here is he embraced and said, oh, no, 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 it's not just legislative assemblies, polling places, and courthouses. It's also schools and government buildings. As a result of that, he was able to say, well, once he said that Heller conclusively said schools and government buildings are protected sensitive places, which is not true because that was all in dicta. That is not a holding. That is not binding. But this, but he embraced it and pretended it was, and I think that was a mistake. But then after he, he said that schools and government buildings can be can ban guns under Supreme Court precedent, which is not true, but that's what he said based on that language I just described in Heller. He then goes on to say that places like museums, school grounds, um, not just the inside of the schools, but the grounds of the schools themselves, uh, healthcare facilities, mass transit facilities, all of these things he basically said in light of the fact that the Heller said that schools and government buildings are can be deemed sensitive. He said these other places, by analogy, are also sensitive. But again, he should have done the work to explain why schools at the time of the founding were sensitive places and government mandated for gun-free zones, because there is no historical analog to suggest that in the least. In fact, the history goes the opposite way that often you know people would bring guns to school, and especially the adults, to the extent there's any authority that says students could not bring guns or could be banned from bringing guns on the campus. There's no precedent whatsoever or historical analog whatsoever that adults, members of the public, school teachers, administrators of schools cannot be armed. So even if you can disarm the students under 
founding era president. You certainly cannot disarm the adults that go to and fro those schools. But again, Judge Russell did not draw that distinction in this case. But again, you're dealing with an Obama appointee in Maryland in the Fourth Circuit. So uh, we got to take any victory we can get there because that's an absolutely terrible scenario and terrible jurisdiction all the way around. So the fact we got a partial win, again, is a huge win. And I congratulate uh, the Second Amendment organizations that brought this case. All right, folks, hope you learned a little bit something here today at the Four Boxes Diner. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter or X at Four Boxes Diner. We'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Order's up. Table 2A.